Oh, good morning. Um, not so good morning with the um, carbon heavy uh, business that's going off above, but you know, we'll cope with it. I want to start by celebrating the acts of civil disobedience that are taking place right now. First of all, I had the deep honor to be joined uh, with Fridays for the Future this morning, who have been doing a little bit of mischief this morning. Um, maybe they'll tell you about it more later, but the car park has been visited this morning and there's been some uh, interventions made by our young people. Thank you very much for that. There's also rebels going on the streets uh, this um, weekend coming in the UK. Animal rebellion have been blocking the supply of milk in the UK. There is just stop oil building tunnels underground. There's an active resistance to the destruction of life on Earth. And so why, why are we doing this? This is what my talk's about. So Extinction Rebellion was launched in October 2018 after a couple of years of planning. We had three simple demands. We wanted, in a time of climate denial, that the truth be told about the ecological crisis, that there be a declaration of emergency, and that emergency would be acted upon with, with great uh, urgency by aiming for net zero uh, in a short space of time and the halting of biodiversity loss. We picked a short date because we know Politicians like to kick the issue into the long grass with long-term targets that they fail to meet. And how to go about this change, this fast transition that we need? Well, we knew that we couldn't do that. We couldn't be there as Extinction Rebellion saying what we thought. And, and in any case, we have a diversity of opinions. So what we wanted uh, was citizens' assemblies on climate and ecological justice. It's a form of deliberative democracy in which the people decide. So Extinction Rebellion is based on a theory of change that mass civil disobedience is necessary to make change, that change does not occur without this as part of the ecosystem. And so, yes, what that does mean is that some of us get arrested. And this is, of course, a little bit of a picture of privilege. I'm racialized as white. Not everybody who gets arrested in the UK is going to have such a jolly time with the police, let's face it. And Extinction Rebellion does not ask everybody to be arrested. In fact, uh, it requires 10 people behind the scenes to support these acts of civil disobedience. People who are doing fundraising, people on social media, people giving talks, people helping to build the movement. So what we say is there is a place for everybody in our movement. And one of the audacious acts of civil disobedience that we did was to place a pink boat in the middle of Oxford Circus, emblazoned with the logo, Tell the Truth. And this is an action that holds the vision of Extinction Rebellion, because what we're saying is that nobody, nobody is coming to rescue us folks from this political system that we live in. We have to rescue ourselves, and we have to be together as we do that. The way the boat remained in place is that you had people, we called them barnacles, you know, those little creatures that attach to boats. We had them locked on to the boat using these sort of tubes, these metal tubes that people uh, put their arms into. They're quite hard to remove, and that's the point, is to stay there as long as possible. There's a little bit of an arms race with these metal tubes, by the way. I have a, a friend of mine who makes them uh, in his garage. He, he makes them when he's feeling especially angry about the political system. He channels his rage into the building of more of these tubes. And given the new prime minister and what she's up to in the UK, I imagine he's there right now building a few more tubes for us, because we will never give up. So our rebellion in April 2019 involved an occupation of London in five different locations. We, we carried it on for 11 days. There were over a thousand arrests. And it's based in a social science, folks. It's based in social movement theory. Now, what that means is that 
Extinction Rebellion has been based on momentum-driven organizing. What we do with that is we define our principles and values, and anybody who wants to take action in the name of Extinction Rebellion is welcome, so long as they meet our principles and values. That's how you decentralize a movement and allow it to spread. People don't have to ask for permission before they take action. And one of our principles and values is about regenerative cultures. We want to do this in the spirit of, of there's logic here in the social science of why we do this. It's based in logic, but fundamentally and beyond that, it's based in love. So many rebels, before they go and they take their action, they make a solemn intention. They offer their act of civil disobedience as a form of prayer in service to life. And here's a, a solemn intention that many rebels have taken. They say, let's take a moment, this moment to consider why we are here. Let's remember our love for this beautiful planet that feeds, nourishes, and sustains us. Let's remember our love for the whole of humanity in all corners of the world. Let's recollect our sincere desire to protect all for ourselves, for all living beings, and for generations to come. As we act today, may we find the courage to bring a sense of peace, love, and appreciation to everyone we encounter, to every word we speak, and to every action we make. We are here for all of us. It's a prayer. It's an act of love. And because of that decentralized organizing, it allowed Extinction Rebellion to grow very quickly. We achieved a global reach. We spread to over 75 countries in a very short space of time. Over a thousand groups have popped up across the world. So thanking groups all over the world. And I want to say that although in the UK we focused on arrest, that may not be appropriate in other countries. The, the, the actions of the police and the state will be different in different places. They will be um, very risky in some parts of the world. Uh, I, I, I'm told by Italian rebels, uh, by the way, that the police here uh, are more violent but less organized. So, you know, you're going to have to take that on however best you, you feel to. And of course, acts of civil disobedience are part of our history. We stand on the shoulders of giants. You've heard, of course, of Mahatma Gandhi, of Rosa Parks, of Martin Luther King. Sometimes our actions are breaking laws that we feel are unjust. As Albert Einstein said, never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it. That is a key call of our times. What is the state and the political system asking of us? And what is our higher self and our humanity asking of us in these times? Sometimes the acts of civil disobedience, they break the power of stories and ideas. The story and idea of climate denial needed to be broken. And sometimes bodies are used in what's called non-violent direct action, in acts of protection. Rebels have chained themselves to trees that are being removed right now in the UK for some mental infrastructure projects. So there are several elements of civil disobedience that are very important. There you go. They must, it must absolutely be based in nonviolence. We teach our rebels the discipline of nonviolence and how to keep our bodies calm in the face of potentially violent responses from the state. To make major change requires a lot of people, thousands, and that requires some very systematic organizing, and we have uh, deep organizing principles baked into our movement. It can be focused on the capital city, that's where the media is, and that's where they're more likely to come and tell the story. Now, to get the story told, unfortunately, very often you have to be disruptive. The mainstream media has not been covering this story. I'm speaking, of course, as a person from the UK here. And so we disrupt the public en masse, and nobody enjoys doing that, but it's part of the process, it's part is necessary. Writing uh, to our politicians, signing petitions, that just has not made the change. 
and we try to prolong it to inflict some kind of economic damage so that the state is required to respond in the face of this activity. You know, and one of the most important things is to make it fun, if possible. There was a lot of dancing around the pink boat. People felt like they were having the time of their lives. So it can be rage and despair and anxiety and grief about the climate that gets people on the streets. But it's fun and it's togetherness and it's a sense of purpose that keeps us there. <clears throat> It also involves, for some of us, the peaceful breaking of windows, obviously when no one is in the building. I myself have broken the window of a bank and of a government department, the Department for Transport, and I can tell you it's a very strange moment in your life when you go to a hardware store and buy a hammer with the intention of breaking a window. As, as the introduction said, I have a PhD in molecular biophysics. I consider myself an intelligent person. And when you sit there and you feel this is what it has come to and this is what it takes, it's a painful moment. But as one of the leading suffragettes said, the argument of the broken pain is the most valuable argument in modern politics. It's how I have got the vote in the UK that the suffragettes took the act of breaking windows. It was part of the change. It's interesting, actually, what we also did with the banks. Some of us took out credit cards and we paid uh, money to uh, Survival International to make an act of repair on behalf of the bank. And we wrote to them and we said, we want you to say that you're, in, you're incentivized to harm, that, you need, that the system needs changing. And, and we want you to stop funding new fossil fuels. And, uh, and on behalf of yourselves, we've just made a donation, and we're not going to be paying you back. We'd like you to match, we'd like you to write it off, and we'll match fund it. I was arrested for that action, and I was also raided. My house was raided at five o'clock in the morning. Um, the police said that I was trying to bring down the entire finance system. I mean, I, frankly, I think it's bringing itself down. But it's interesting, in such a corrupt world where the finance system is up to all sorts. Uh, in my interview with the police, I said, you know, so we've had the FinCEN files, we've had the Panama Papers, we've had LuxLeaks, they nearly brought the entire economic system down. We've got offshore tax havens, you know, we've, we, we've had uh, PPI mis-selling, um, and you're arresting me, and I owe them 70 pounds, right? <laughs> uh, how many bankers did you arrest recently? What's interesting about that, by the way, is that sometime later, quite recently, I got introduced in a Chatham House rule meeting to the former vice chairman of a major high street bank. And he said he agreed with our actions, he understood them, and that the employees of Barclays Bank felt that change was not happening fast enough and that the chief executive of Barclays Bank felt that he couldn't make the change within the current system. And myself and my colleagues said, why will you not say that publicly? Why do you leave it to us as activists to make that statement? And I will actually be in my defense saying that in fact the banks consent to the breaking of their windows. Because folks, we have, in this current world, we have a sociopathic system that is killing life on Earth, and we have human beings in those institutions and they're at odds with each other. So, of course, we did this disruption, and people often say, well, we agree with your message, but we don't like the method. And we say, tell us a different method that's going to have the impact. And we saw that we had an impact. This is a YouGov poll. When we were on the streets in London in 2019, in the April, there was a spike in people being concerned about the environment. And the needle has been shifted through the acts of Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for the Futures, and others, and, and many people in this room. But we saw a specific spike aligned with our protests. And what of those three demands? Well, the UK Parliament 
declared a climate and ecological emergency, and the UK government committed to net zero by 2050. And then six select committees called a citizens' assembly uh, on how to, the UK should tackle climate. It's on the BBC, it's an interesting programme. Onalytica named XR as the number one global influencer on climate. That was two months after we launched. Professor Molly Scott Cato, who's a Green, who was a Green MEP before Brexit, said that Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for the Future made her job possible. And I often meet people who work in sustainability who say to me um, that you have changed, the, your organisation has changed the landscape and we are now more listened to. I, I, Greta Thunberg has actually said that people talk to her behind the scenes as well, but they don't say the things in public. Okay, so that all sounds cool, <laughs> but let's take a reality check. The UK carbon footprint has only gone down by 2% since 2017. There's some funny reporting they do on, on the statistics of carbon I could, I could answer in the questions. Um, so we're not really taking action. We know that democracies like so-called democracies like the UK need to be reducing their carbon by 45% at least in the next decade. As Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General said, some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying and the results will be catastrophic. It's a climate emergency, but high-emitting governments and corporations are not just turning a blind eye, they're adding fuel to the flames. They're choking our planet based on their vested interests and historic investments in fossil fuels. And he added, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals. I, I wonder if I look like a dangerous radical to you this morning. But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. And so what that really gets me to wonder is, is why. I'm sure everybody here wonders why are we doing this to ourselves? Why is humanity destroying the life support systems of the planet? And there's a, a discipline called the five whys, where you ask yourself this question, and you answer the first why, and then you ask it again and again, and you try to really get to the root of the problem. And that's what I want to talk to for the rest of this talk, because how are we to act together? I'm sure that many of you in, I don't know, the work you're doing here, but feel like you're pushing water up a hill. You know, feel that you are acting in a small way as best you can, but that the, the whole system is geared in a different direction. Well, of course, there has been an active and funded movement to stop action on the climate and ecological emergency. We know well about this. Um, the, the climate denial funded by the fossil fuel companies. And we've moved, actually, from a time that's focused on climate de denial to what's called discourses of delay. There are ways to distract from, from proper uh, action from considering what these times really require. And to me, it would be about going into an emergency mode, the kind of thing after a post-war cleanup. All resources and focus of, of, of the society would be built on the repair and the solving of this problem. And clearly, that's not where we are, we are at. And so there's the things about redirecting responsibility, about techno-optimism, technology is going to at some point come and rescue us, pushing for the downsides or saying it's too late, just give up. You know, there are ways in which the system has moved deliberately into these discourses of delay. And, and, and how do they get to do that? But well, we haven't tackled this crisis because we have a political economy, a chosen economic system that creates crises and is incapable of solving them. There's a constant focus on GDP. The goal of our political economy is more. Extraction, more. 
why is that a goal that humanity would want to get behind? Bad behavior is incentivized. Pollution and biodiversity loss are externalized. Built-in obsolescence becomes logical. Uh, if you like to do the Slido, the question is, is it possible to tackle the climate and ecological crisis within the current economic system and GDP growth? I like the hope so. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you think that. <laughs> if we could move on to the slide. I know you're still doing that. As Greta said, you only talk about moving forwards with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. She's got a way with words that last, eh? So this concept of green growth, for example, it, growth tracks material footprint. It just does. And increasingly, the IPCC is speaking out against growth-based solutions. It requires negative emission technologies. It, it requires injustice. And the idea is that you can decouple carbon emissions from, uh, from the destruction of the planet, certainly not on biodiversity. Even the green growth has admit that. And there's been a major literature review assessing 835 papers looking for evidence of this decoupling. You can get partial decoupling, but you cannot get rapid enough decoupling. The paradigm of growth, the paradigm of more, has to be over. And actually, the Green Swan report from the uh, Bank of International Settlements did say that, um, that bringing the economic system back within the Earth's sustainability limits could entail re-evaluating the notion of endless economic growth itself. There are, there are physical scientists who are pointing out the impossibility of constant growth. We have to move on. Professor Kevin Anderson said he'd that we'd rather question physics than the economic model. And um, he started to say that he prefers to call economists astrologists, and they shouldn't be trusted with any numbers except page numbers. And Thomas Mur Murphy has done the maths on the limit to economic growth as well, to try and beg the economists to be logical, to see sense. And even those that have been at the forefront of this current neoliberal economic system, Mrs. Thatcher said, we should always remember that free markets are a means to an end. They would defeat their object if by their output they did more damage to the quality of life through pollution than the well-being they achieve by the production of goods and services. Milton Friedman said that the great virtue of a market capitalist society is that by preventing a concentration of power, it prevents people from doing the kind of harm which really concentrated power could do. I wish he was alive today to test whether he thinks his economic system is stopping the concentration of power when you have six billionaires owning the same wealth as half of the planet. Look, folks, we're not lacking good ideas about what to do. I'm glad that the next talk is focused on donut economics from Kate Rayworth. We have bioregional economics uh, from Molly Scott Cato, mission-based economics, degrowth, you know, regenerative economics, circular economics. We have a vast amount of imaginative solutions. It also, um, the idea of creating international law to criminalize mass damage and destruction of the planet, the ecocide law, the idea of providing universal basic services. It's a foundational proposal of the degrowth movement. We can use biomimicry. This is not anti-technology. We can localize our economies, think about the land. And I really love this um, idea from George Monbiot that we would have private sufficiency and public luxury. 
So then again, let's ask that why, why are we here? Why are we destroying life on Earth? You know, I used to live in the mountains as a scientist, and I've been asking myself, when I think about the glaciers melting and the impact that's going to have, but when I just think about the melting, I think, I know, how to, I know how to grieve when my grandma died. I know how to grieve when my friend who was 18 died, even though it was super painful. How do you grieve for the loss of ice? How do you grieve for the loss of life on Earth? And one of the foundational parts of Extinction Rebellion has been to say that we have to feel these times. We have to engage with our humanity and connect to the meaning of these times. So, human societies, it turns out, we have lived in many different ways. There's a really cool book that's out in recent times by Graeber and Wengro, who look at anthropology and archaeological data. There have been matriarchal, matrifocal, really, societies in the past. But something happened, probably a traumatic event, maybe something like 5,000 years ago, and humanity, some aspects of humanity, embarked on a process of domination. And what we mean by that is that, that we want more, we always want more, and when we get more, when we extract, we use the new resources that we have to dominate and take more. And, and, and the domination paradigm, it just keeps extracting and it keeps taking more. And again, we're a species. You know, we're homo sapiens. Why would we do this? So, there's something about thinking about the nature of human beings. There's some amazing work by Ian McGilchrist and Jill Bolte-Taylor based on 5,000 papers where we understand the neurophysiology now of human beings. And it was Alexandra Solnetsyism, <laughs> I say his name wrong every time, who said that the uh, line between good and evil passes through each human's heart. He was correct in spirit, but somehow incorrect biologically. There is a very great distinction down the middle of your head in the two hemispheres of the mind. The left hemisphere, it's not evil, but it has the capacity to behave like a sociopath, a narcissist. The left hemisphere is meant to be in service to the right. The right hemisphere is connected to life. It's in love with life. It's part of life. It's being. It's the consciousness of presence. It is before language. It is into music. It's into beauty. And the left hemisphere, it takes reality and it represents it to you as a person. It's a calculator. It reduces. It abstracts, it has its value, but it's not meant to be in charge. And you'll know when your left hemisphere is in charge, because <laughs> it affects your nervous system. So another part of the nature of human beings, and this is the polyvagal theory, is that we have nervous system states. So one of them is the sort of freeze and the shutdown. Another is the fight, flight. My mind looks like this, right? <laughs> you know, when I'm in that. There's another part of our humanity led by the right hemisphere that's about social engagement, about joy being in the present, grounded, connected to life. It's curious, it's empathetic, it's playful, it's compassionate, it's mindful. And it, I would say for anybody who's taken action, it's contingent on you to understand your own inner landscape. This is where the earth starts, folks, in these bodies. How do you be in your best self as a human being if you're here to make service to life. Now, what has happened with the domination paradigm created by the left hemisphere is that it has set up a system now, a global system, that has been self-reinforcing for many years. It's gone through periods of colonialism and neo-colonialism. And it means you as an individual will have a response to the system. You will have a location within it. We're mostly racialized as white here. You will have your needs met over other people, our family in the global south, for example. You will have your wants triggered. The left hemisphere always wants more. It always wants more. It's never enough when it's stressed. 
it wants more. And, you, and, and, and when you're in that state, there's a $650 billion dollar an, uh, annual spend of the um, advertising industry to tell you that consumerism is the way to get these needs met. Now, how does that system stay in place? There's a system that creates culture, so-called culture. It's more like a disease. It, it's captured our economic and regulatory systems. It's given us a fake democracy. Global finance runs riot across the planet. And it is based within this paradigm of more, the desire for more. And we are not at a stage now where we need new policies. Of course we do, that's part of it. But we actually are required now to shift a paradigm. This system is self-reinforcing. There are feedback loops. So global finance will concentrate power and wealth in certain hands. It will capture the regulatory system. It will give money to certain people in the media. Billionaires own the media in the UK. They will promote certain politicians. You know what I'm talking about. I'm sure the capture of the whole system. Now, what this system does is it requires you to behave. It requires you to behave in service to it one way or another. It asks, for your com it asks for your complicity. It asks for your silence. It separates us from each other, and it separates us from nature. And, and what that means, even in the world of sustainability, even in this world, that there's greenwashing. We all know about the greenwashing. You know, there's a fakeness to the response to the climate and ecological emergency. It's of the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere does this thing, it's called confabulation. Good luck with that, translators, by the way, at the back, thank you. Confabulation, it means making things up to suit your own uh, interpretation of the world, whether it's correct or not. And, the, and, the, and that you have to be complicit is a painful thing for human beings. You, we've had some people speaking out now. The CIO of BlackRock, Tariq Fancy, said that the ESG world, the environmental social governance, was, was actually part of the problem because it was making it seem like the system as it exists could create the solutions when it's not possible. I've had whistleblowers talk to me about their role in ESG and saying that I cannot make the change through this. I know people are trying their best, right? I know everybody's trying their best. One of them was part of Shell, and they said they've done 15 years in Shell trying to make sustainability happen. Unless it makes a profit, it's sidelined. So we know about these reinforcing feedback loops. There are ac academia on this. There are vicious cycles in the for-profit economy. Inf reinforces inequality, reinforces consumerism, and reinforces political capture. Now, this system of domination is understood culturally, especially by indigenous people. They talk about wetiko in the Algonquin languages, Windingo also. In Buddhism, it's called the hungry ghost. In, in Hinduism, it's called the rakshasas. In the culture I live in, we have vampires and zombies. We know humanity has this weakness in it where it can just be like, uh, I'm just going to do what I'm told, you know? <laughs> and where Tico shows up is scarcity, separation, and powerlessness is anti-life, is anti-life. And one of the things I'm asking you today, it's quite out there, but recognize where Tico in your life. This is what these times require of us, to understand this disease. And what the indigenous folks of the Haudenosaunee nations say is that we have to cultivate a good mind. It's a practice that humanity needs to do. We have to reintroduce cultures that bring about a good mind. That's the balance between the left and right hemispheres. There's many stories related. So then what are we asked to do now? What are we asked to do now? I'm working with others on an evolutionary strategic approach for Extinction Rebellion. We call it being the change. We talk about relate, repair, resist. And so the foundational piece is relationship of the right hemisphere of life. You know, it's about protecting the dignity and stability and integrity and vitality and beauty of life, of making our lives about that. The domination paradigm pushes in, is into feelings of powerlessness, scarcity, separation. They're just bodily functions, folks. You can 
do practices that take you away from that and move us into what are called the softer qualities of vulnerability, mourning, humility, and tenderness. And, and what I'm suggesting is that any groups that we're focused in need to be in active relationship to the land, to each other. And then we can look at this system and we can make repair of this system. And I think there's a question for all of us to ask ourselves, what is mine to repair? Of all the damage that's been done, what is mine and ours in my group? What is ours to repair? I get quite obsessed with um, rewilding, micro rewilding. I've got lots of little sparrows in my garden. They've dec decreased by 77%, but not in my garden. They've gone up by 100%, just by letting nature have the garden back. And there's something important for our acts of change to be in repair. Humans need to feel agency. We need to feel the vision of the change that we want. We need to stand in the wisdom of the resistance traditions. And we need to feel our togetherness. When you put those things together, there's an attraction force in the universe. It comes together. I call it the magic source. It has got a sociological term I can flick between sounding like a mental hippie and a scientist. It's called collective effervescence in sociology. And we can do acts of repair together. And you know, thank you to those here doing regenerative agriculture. Um, th this can, in a not-for-profit economy, create positive feedback loops. I'm not going to get into that, but th you know, th this will act together in concert. And so we build our change in communities of togetherness. And, and I think it's even beyond a social movement, it's about how we act together now as a human species and really understand that we have to leave something behind and we have to bring forward a new aspect to humanity. It's an old way in many cultures and traditions. And that's the beauty, we don't have to reinvent something, we make it for these times. And so, what we're suggesting in being the change is that we, act, we connect, we call it glocalizing, we glocally connect our actions of repair and resistance to other parts of the world. Because this is a human family in which there are sacrifice zones and extraction, as we all know, in the Global South, and there is active resistance in the Global South. And it's on us now to feel our connection to our family across the world as we act here. And you know, one of the benefits of that is it takes the burden off the white shoulders because we can do this together. You don't have to do it all. Especially saying that to the young people. Don't stress about it. Really, enjoy. You know, enjoy and be, because this is life. Life wants you to live. You know, you don't have to do this from a place of, ah, because you're in that <laughs> fight flight. Of course we must feel our grief. You know, of course, but when the despair and anxiety comes, we, we find our hope through action. And so we have this picture of an immune response that humanity gets to understand that we have this broken side to ourselves called wet eco, domination paradigm, neoliberal capitalism, whatever you want to call it, and that we can act in concert to recognize it and that we all have a role. And we start to act globally in resistance. And what does that look like? You know, there are people on the front, take the Adani coal mine. The Adani coal mine will have the carbon footprint of the entire UK. And there are indigenous people in resistance stopping that coal mine from happening. There have been activists, young people, who've gone and in support and in the wisdom of the resistance that's already there. It may be that people want to go to some front lines. If, if resistance in that way is not your thing, please be in support of it. Please understand that we're human beings trying to be, as human beings, protecting, protecting what's precious. Employees are an Achilles heel in the system. The system creates institutions that are sociopathic. 
but it's full of good people. We've seen employees acting together in Google, you know, in Amazon and so on. Employees, it's a really important part, part of the movement for change. Insurance companies can be uh, a, a focal point, you know. There's something about trying to ensure, you know, the destruction of life on Earth that is illogical. We can ask these small institutions not to insure, and we can give them a lot of pressure. There can be NGOs that act in concert, trade unions, you know, there, there will be, in, in, in social movement theory, we talk about agitate, innovate, orchestrate. This is the orchestration phase of change where we act in concert. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to stop feeling disconnected from each other. Whatever we're doing, it's connected. There's a togetherness that humanity needs right now. And so I want to remind us of who we are as people. As Pat McCabe said, she's a, a member of the DNA Navajo Nation. She said, humanity has low self-esteem right now as a species because we have this idea at this moment that all we touch, we destroy. It's not so, it's not so, it's not so. That's not inherent in our nature. It's a learned response to a certain beliefs and to a certain paradigm that we've agreed upon. The right role of human beings, of homo sapiens on the earth, is to make life more beautiful. We are keystone species, hyper-keystone species. We are ecosystem engineers. There's a lot in social psychology about who we are as people and how even our better sides can be weaponized against us. Recognize when that's happening. Find your place in the new world that humanity is going to create. And let's feel it together. It's beautiful, it's exciting. Frankly, I think it's a bit sexual. It's really cool, and that's how the change is going to come. Thank you. I, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did want to say that our the local Extinction Rebellion group tomorrow night at six o'clock is holding a talk in the Science Museum on socially just ways to capture carbon. So find your inner rebel. And, and go and join Extinction Rebellion tomorrow, 6 p.m. at the Science Museum. And by the way, if you do have any questions for me, I skipped over a lot of material mm -hmm. uh, because just for the nature of the talk. I will go to Speaker's Corner afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. That was, please join us here in our, in our Q&A corner, shall we call it. Um, happy you told the audience that you will be in the Speaker Corner because we got loads of questions, so it's impossible to get through all of them in the next 10 minutes, but uh, you will be available later, so if we don't get to your question, you can find this wonderful lady there. Um, all right, so first we're gonna take questions from the room. Anybody in, in the audience have a burning question? Come on, nothing? Oh my gosh, you totally got my blood going. I feel like I have 10,000 questions in my head. But, okay, so you guys are gonna think about it, but Online via Slido, we also have had, again, like I said, lots of questions. So let's just jump into uh, the most popular one thus far, which is, don't the disruptive actions of Extinction Rebellion more often than not hit the wrong audience? So, i.e., the general public, and not as they should, in this person's opinion, the politicians. Well, you have to ask, how do you reach the politicians? You reach the politicians by changing public opinion. And how do you change public opinion? By getting the story of the problem out into the public. And how do you do that in a media that's not telling the story truthfully? Is that you create disruption, and then you end up in the media, and they spend a lot of time telling you off, and you keep saying, this is the problem. And so, as I said in my talk, this is based on, on social science research, on communications research. Um, we also do target uh, politicians and institutions, but all of us really, myself included, are complicit in this crisis. My experience of uh, disrupting the public is more often than not, they sort of 
Sai, realize they're going to be delayed in the traffic for some time, and thank you for what you're doing. I see. All right, democracy exists in our nations, and governments are voted by people. Now, if everyone disobeys the rules, anarchy is created. How can an anarchic society stand? Well, that's interesting that whoever asked that question thinks we have a functional democracy. My understanding of representational democracy is about informed consent. You're supposed to have good information. When you have a, a media system that's in the thrall of billionaires and a neoliberal economic system that wants more, you're not having a good sharing of information. If there was true leadership from politicians, I would be happy with the current democratic system. As I said, what we want to do in Extinction Rebellion is bring about citizens' assemblies, deliberative forms of democracy alongside our representational democracies. This question of anarchy, it's one of those words that's been sort of weaponized. You can't, there, there, there is um, a, a, a former diplomat who calls himself the accidental anarchist. All, all that word actually means, by the way, is people self-organizing. But it's a word now that you're not allowed to be associated with at all. If you read the book that I mentioned, Graeber and Wengro, uh, human history has had lots of um, deliberative and, and, and people-based, what you might call anarchic, uh, situations in the past. Now, I don't know what form of democracy we need. Maybe it's a question I could have asked, but certainly in the UK, I do not consider it to be a functional democracy. And one in eight people would tend to agree with me according to st statistics. And 72% of people in the UK don't think they have any real agency to make change. Mm. So how is that a functional democracy? Mm. Thank you for those insights. I believe we have a question in the room. There it is. Um, hi, thanks for your presentation, Gail, it was great. Um, my question is a little bit more abstract. So um, I'm part of Fridays for Future and part of the Extinction Rebellion. Very recently here, I just joined. Um, I also recently saw that we have, I think it was 0.1% probability of reaching the 1.5 degree uh, target. So how do you stay motivated to keep doing anything when it feels like it doesn't really matter, we're kind of screwed anyway? Hmm. Thank you for your Ooh. question, and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and we need each other in these times so that we can process those feelings of despair. It is part of the polyvagal system that your body goes into is a feeling it's, if, and when you're in that feeling of despair, you can do what I do sometimes, you know, dodgy things, bad food. <laughs> you know, we all do it, right? It doesn't particularly help. Uh, but what does help is being together. And, and um, as Dougald Hines said, we're at a time now where we either go in the direction of more democracy or less. The risk that we have is that this current system decides to protect the global north in some ways, just some of us, mostly people racialized as white, and we travel in the direction of eco-fascism. So this struggle is here for all of our lives. So the only way I think we can be to in this struggle is by being together, being in your body, listening to the wisdom of your body. And when we talk about regenerative cultures in Extinction Rebellion, it's not a side issue. Sometimes it gets called regen, having time off, right? It's not that. It's that as well. But it's about taking care of yourself, you know. And I don't think it's possible to hold up this possibility for humanity on your own. You have to be with other people and feel held. And frankly, I don't know how this is going to unfold, but I do know that I want to be with life and I want to be with this change. And that's all I can do is be in service, do my best, keep thinking, keep playing, stay playful with it. And, and, and that's why we connect to the other parts of the world, the other resistance in the world, so we know it's not just all on our shoulders, right? Mm. So take care of yourself, sister. Mm. <laughs> and if you're around for the rest of the day, we will be talking more about that in the afternoon with our sessions later sessions on this climate anxiety and, yeah. and how, how to better deal with this. We're running out of time, but just a, a com it's more a comment than anything else, but it's gotten sure. a lot of feedback, which is common sense is needed on every scale of public and private organizations. Just 
common sense would help so much, and sometimes it just feels like it's missing. Well, this is what I'm saying about the, um, the hemispheres, folks, right? The, the left hemisphere is not one of common sense. We know this through neuroimaging studies, through brain lesion studies, you know, if people have strokes and from people with specific conditions. We can understand what happens when the left hemisphere is in charge. It doesn't do common sense. It makes shit up, frankly. <laughs> you know, it really, as I said, the, the, the technical term is confabulation. It will manipulate and lie. It behaves like a sociopath when it's out of balance. And, and that's why it's become systematized. It is mind-boggling, but still not surprising in some ways, that we have now have a prime minister in the UK who's talking about fracking the country it, 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 and, and has put in charge in the last few days uh, somebody who's been a climate denier in the past. He's now in charge of climate action, a climate denier. Mind-boggling, but not when you understand that you're in a paradigm of more that takes sociopaths and puts them into positions of power. So don't, in my view, don't ask this system for change. You can ask this system for change um, as a tactic, free demands to the government. I don't think that's where the change will come. Don't ask sociopaths to change. That's the point. They're not change. They might pretend they are. That's greenwashing. And we've had a couple of questions also coming in about, uh, you know, again, the ties to policy, but also economics. Um, and basically, someone wants to know, are you saying that we have to stop having capitalism to solve this crisis? Thank you for that question. I, I like that question a lot. I don't think we've got capitalism, actually. It's so corrupted. You know, capitalism is supposed to be about the free market and, and, and market information. Uh, when you've got 50% of money going through secrecy jurisdictions, you know, um, as, the, as Paolo said yesterday, the, the majority of the economy is small businesses. It doesn't have the same access to tax dodging. Um, you also have monopoly power that's supposed to not be in capitalism, but it's now allowed. Has anybody noticed that? You know, I've got friends who are, who are in the balanced economy projects and looking at that very agenda. So I, I don't even consider this capitalism. It's just basically, of course, of course there's some good stuff as well, don't get me wrong, B corporations. Mm. It's basically deeply corrupted. Um, and, and, and when you use that word capitalism or anti-capitalism, I won't absorb, I won't adopt that term as an anti-capitalist because it's a trope mm -hmm. and it's used to say that you're anti-business, anti-markets. Business and markets have been around for centuries. And it's a trope to say, oh, you just want, you know, this form of communism that we tried and it doesn't work. You know, of course not. You know, when nobody wants to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? But if we don't face up to the fact that we deeply have to change this economic system we're in, I just don't think we've got a chance of making the change. All right. Thank you for those closing words and for all of your insights this morning. Amazing. Round of applause. Thank you so much, Gail.